Daniel chapter 5 is our text for this morning as we take our monthly look to work through this book of Daniel. When we come, while you're, as you're turning, as we come to a passage like the one we have today, I need you all to remember Christ because ultimately that is who Scripture is always pointing to. But because we are in the Old Testament, we're dealing with kings, pagan kings and prophets of old. Sometimes we don't get to say the name of Jesus and I don't try to pry Jesus in there. He's already there. And I don't try to pry Christ in there. He's already there. And so for those that are not Christians, they can sometimes hear a sermon like this and walk away thinking I've talked about some kind of um, gen generic general God. And so please know, as we work through texts such as this about Christ, Christ is the message behind all the texts of Scripture. We are always talking and speaking when we say God about the triune God of Christianity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ being the second person of that Trinity. And even as Daniel has prophesied already, Daniel knows and is pointing to the one who is going to come, the stone that will come and grow and create this kingdom on earth. Amen. So let us then read now Daniel chapter five. <coughs> King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck 
and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence, the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter, Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple and a chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Thus, for the reading of the word of God, let us pray. Our great God, we ask that you would speak to us from these words that you gave to Daniel from his life, from his interaction with this king so that we might know you more fully and love you more dearly and share the truth of your word with others for your glory. We pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the first four chapters of Daniel that we have covered, we have been instructed from the life of Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, as they have dealt with remaining faithful as exiles under the king Nebuchadnezzar. Each chapter has basically been its own story, its own narrative that has taught us something about God and how he works and how God has used them and also how God has continued to work or continued to work in the life of Nebuchadnezzar to show that king, that worldly king, that he was the one true God and that even Nebuchadnezzar himself must bow before him. And we saw Nebuchadnezzar do just that at the end of chapter four. And now in chapter five, all of a sudden, we have this new king, Belshazzar, a new story, a new narrative, And we will directly see again, as what's gone before, the sovereignty of God over situations in this life and the pride of men, as Nebuchadnezzar had as well. But also in the larger picture, it seems that we are going to be presented with now a contrast with how God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar 
and how he is dealing with Belshazzar. And then quietly, this text at the end gives us a look into the advance of God's kingdom through what God does even in uh, one, what, what might be a, a seemingly insignificant event that is meant to teach us something, but it is actually preparing the way for the kingdom of God, the advance of God's kingdom, the fulfillment of prophecy, and we will come to that at the end as well. And so we have this king before us now, this new king, Belshazzar. The way this story abruptly enters the picture, along with what we've already seen, what is going to be occurring in the later chapters of Daniel as well, it should point us to the fact that all of these narratives in their entirety are are pointing to teach God's people about the conflict that goes on in this world between God and his people, those that represent him, those that are faithful, and the people of this world, the people that are of their father, the devil, as Jesus has pointed out himself. Um, Everyone, even modern Christendom, doesn't always like to talk in those terms, but those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ are not our brothers, and they set themselves up against God. And that is who we see here before us in Belshazzar. And as we look at this story as well, as we just look at, at it from a larger or from, from a distance, there's not even a lot of story here. There's not background to the story. And that creates some issues that I'm going to address uh, briefly here. Um, In history, we know, not from this text, that there was some sort of coup at some point towards the end of the Babylonian Empire. There was no king listed uh, in Babylon as Belshazzar. And so both of those things have caused all kinds of consternation for liberal theologians and those simply seeking to discredit Scripture and what it says. Uh, But what we also have from extra biblical sources is that the succession from uh, Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar, as we see it, seems to be from Nebuchadnezzar to a man by the name of Amel Marduk, then to a man by the name of Nabonidus. And then Nabonidus had a son that was named Belsar-Usur, or transliterated a bit differently, Belshazzar. Uh, And Nabonidus, uh, it again appears in history that he was not very well liked. He moved the capital outside of Babylon and he left his son, Belsar Assur or Belshazzar in charge in Babylon. And being the prideful man that Belshazzar apparently seems to be, he must have adopted the title of king for himself to especially to these exiles. And for some support of the idea that Nabonidus was actually still the king and then Belshazzar was serving as this, as a prince or an under king for for his own purposes, please note in verse 16, just right off the bat, that Belshazzar offers to Daniel to become the third ruler in the kingdom, the third greatest ruler, and not the second, which Belshazzar certainly would have offered him if he was actually the first ruler in the kingdom. And so that's where we come to the point that Belshazzar is a king in his own mind. He's a king to the exiles, but actually his father, Nabonidus, which is another issue, is the king of Babylon at this time. And so if you're unfamiliar, and we've mentioned this in other contexts as well, Again, just to get some technical things out of the way. In Hebrew, the term for fathers and the term for sons is also used for grandfathers and grandsons. And that causes much consternation for liberal theologians as well. They also use the terms for father and sons if they're simply talking about my ancestors or my descendants. Uh, And so the technical uh, linguistics that modern theologians Uh, an atheist's want is unsatisfied 
but it's really uncalled for as well in these ancient texts where they use these generic terms uh, as a sign of respect and a sign of recognition of their familial connection. Uh, So ancient men from many cultures would use these kinds of terms to call their ancestors and their descendants fathers and sons. But the point is that God is showing us here as we work through this, uh, he's showing through the labors of Daniel as well, this contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Sinclair Ferguson uh, wrote that it is a reminder, this contrast is a reminder that we dare not presume upon the grace which God has shown to others, which is what Belshazzar is doing, it seems, as we work through. He's presuming upon the grace that God had shown to Nebuchadnezzar. To know that God is gracious, as Belshazzar would have known, but not turn from your sin in the light of that grace is to fall and will result in a fall under his righteous judgment. And such is the experience of Belshazzar. God has shown grace to Nebuchadnezzar, but something different now is coming for Belshazzar. And we find two things uh, that we need to see, at least from these first nine verses. First, we learn here that God deals with sin in his own way and in his timing. God deals with sin in his own way and in, and in his timing, not according to the way we think he ought to uh, for others or even for us. It may have looked to these exiles that the God of Israel had forgotten them. They're out in exile. It's now many years later, as we will see for Daniel as well, that he'd forgotten about his righteousness. He'd forgotten about this judgment that was coming or that was supposed to be coming because now there's this exceedingly wicked man that is on the throne in Babylon. How are they ever going to return from exile as Jeremiah had promised they would? There had even been a time when Daniel himself had been highly respected by the king, by King Nebuchadnezzar, but now even that seems to have gone away. It seems from these first verses that Daniel has been forgotten. He's much older now. His importance to Nebuchadnezzar is gone because Nebuchadnezzar is gone. New leadership has come into the picture. And the way that the world works, again, is normally that new leadership comes in, prideful new leadership. It seeks prideful new counselors because the old men did uh, things the old way. And God, whoever the God might be for others as well, is always doing something new, right? No, return to the old paths we read in Scripture. Or sometimes new leadership wants people that will simply tell them what they want to hear. Daniel, a servant of God, is not the kind of man that is simply going to tell you what you want to hear as well. But whatever the mind of Belshazzar might have been, it was not on the way that things had been done by his father or the way that things ought to be done. And we find that he is prideful and that he is foolish. The city is under siege. You only barely know this uh, from that last verse in this chapter. Um, In verse 30, we see that Darius the Mede quickly moves in. Again, it it didn't happen that he died and then at some point in the future, Darius and the, the, Mer, the Persians and the Medes were sitting outside of the city. Again, we know this from history. And they were trying uh, to starve the Babylonians into submission. This was going on outside of the gates at this time. And Belshazzar, instead of being concerned with what's going on outside of the city, throws a party. In his arrogance, he believes that they have plenty of time. They have plenty of food. They have plenty of water stored up. And they probably did, which is why he felt secure. But God had other plans. And so Belshazzar throws this party, this feast. 
he brings in the wine, he brings in the concubines, and they are going to get drunk, and they are going to debauch themselves and worse. In verses two through four, we see that Belshazzar blasphemes Jehovah by bringing out the temple vessels, the gold and the silver vessels set apart for holy use in the temple of God that Nebuchadnezzar had had stored, and they're going to use them for blasphemous purposes. These vessels represent the presence of God on earth. They represent the atoning work of God pointing to Christ, pointing to our Messiah. And this pagan king brings them out and he would use them for gluttony and food and drink and sensual pleasure and to be used to praise false gods. In verse four, we read of this act of blasphemy, not just in drinking wine from the vessels. If I was a good Baptist, I would talk to you about getting drunk, but that's not the worst thing that's going on here. What's going on is that they are praising gods, other gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone with vessels that are meant for the one true God. Anything they can praise, it seems, that's in front of them, they will praise with these vessels of Yahweh. And they are, and this is the nice way to say it, they are thumbing their nose at the one true God, as if nothing will ever happen, as if no judgment will ever come. These are the vessels of your God. We will drink to other gods with them. But something does happen. And verse five says it happens immediately. A second doesn't pass. They praise these gods and immediately. And if you ask me, this it would be terrifying. We'll see that it was terrifying for Belshazzar. Fingers appear and writing begins upon the wall. Again, this is sometimes we read these things like they're a story, and I'm telling you this is true, and it was terrifying. The king sees this, it says, as it's happening. He sees the fingers appear. He sees the writing begin on the wall. And so this just doesn't appear out of nowhere. All of a sudden there's writing on the wall and we don't know where it came from and we've got to look. There is the vision of a hand writing upon the wall. God allows for this supernatural event to be noted, to be seen by the king himself. And the verse says, Daniel writes that his thoughts alarmed him, his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. Now, I don't know if you've heard about this verse before, but this can be translated more accurately. It says the joints of his, lo- uh, the joints of his loins were loosed. And again, they're trying to be polite. What they're saying is he urinated himself. He saw what was happening and he urinated himself. And in the, in the Aramaic, as this was written in, his knees, more accurately described here, his knees would have been violently knocking together. It's almost as if he went into a convulsion of terror when he saw this hand writing upon the wall. In this fear, Don't miss, again, we read these things too simply too. It says the king called loudly. The king is shouting. The king is crying out for his counselors, for his enchanters. Get in here and tell me what this means. And they cannot read what is coming. It's their language. They can't read it. Belshazzar grows more concerned. He grows more sick, really is what he is telling us as well. He grows more sick inside as he should be. And so from these first nine verses, a few things that we learn or that are reinforced in these verses is that God is sovereign. 
God is always in control. Daniel is recording this for the people of Israel to know, for us to know. There may be great and evil kings in power, but at any given moment, immediately, if God determines, God can act if he has so chosen and bring men to their knees, literally lying in their own sickness and filth and crying out for someone to help them if that's what God wants to do. This man was surrounded outside of the city gates. He could have thought, remembered, called upon the one true God as he had been taught and learned from his father Nebuchadnezzar as Nebuchadnezzar had done. He could have called upon Daniel. And again, maybe he did forget. And he could have asked about these Vessels of gold and silver, why do we have them? What do we signify? What do they signify? What can we do about these, this enemy at the gates? But instead, in his vanity and pride and depravity, he profanes God's vessels, forgets his father, Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar's counselor, Daniel. We also see again from these verses that judgment is coming. John Knox once wrote, because nations do not have souls, God must bring all their judgments in this world. I'll read that again. John Knox, Scottish pastor, theologian once wrote, because nations do not have souls, God must bring all their judgment in this world. And the judgment of God is coming for Babylon and it's coming for every nation. God may be long suffering in his rebuke and in his punishment, but judgment is coming. And that is why God's people who live in exile here, and again, we are exiles today. We are not a people of a particular nation. We are Christians living in the world. Our King is Christ. And we are exiles waiting for his return. And so we must put our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and not in these worldly kings. Kings will rise, kings will fall, and we must look to simply serve our king. And when he brings judgment, which he will upon a nation, upon nations that we live in, we must remember as well that God promises, again, this is throughout scripture, He promises to protect his people as we are faithful and he brings judgment upon corrupt and evil nations. Psalm 37, verse 28, we read, for the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. And here we see the judgment that is coming upon Babylon as as had been foretold and God who is going to be faithful to his people as we will see. And with this then we must never presume as Belshazzar is doing upon the long suffering and the grace of God. There comes a time when God has had enough. He has had enough. It is safe to assume as we will again mention further in a few minutes Belshazzar knew of the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. Proclamations had been sent forth from Nebuchadnezzar about the greatness of Yahweh and the praise and the exaltation and honor that Nebuchadnezzar had for the one true God. It would have been part of the official record. It would have been passed down to Belshazzar and his family. And Belshazzar neglects the truth. He neglects history. He decides to praise everything but the one true God. And we must learn, even if Belshazzar will not, to never presume upon the patience of God and long, and, and long suffering, and long suffering of our blasphemy and our sin against our God. And so the Lord sends someone to remind Belshazzar of history in verse 10. 
and it's also to move his providence along. Here we find the second thing that we need to learn uh, in this chapter, and that's that God will use his faithful servants in his timing. God will use his servants in his timing. In modern Christendom, again, it's like we have this celebrity mentality, just like the world has. And if someone is being used by God, then they are supposed to be getting used by God all the time. They are just supposedly uh, knocking home runs every time they get up to bat, if you will. But that's not what happens in Scripture, uh, in life. God simply calls us to be faithful every day. And we see a few events. We have a few events in the life of Daniel that are tremendously significant that the Holy Spirit writes down through Daniel. But I can guarantee you, and you know, that there are these events are surrounded by hundreds and thousands of days where Daniel is simply committed to God's word and prayer and being faithful. Daniel would get up. What am I going to do today? I'm going to read. I'm going to meditate on God's word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be faithful to the commands of God. And then when a time of significant comes, it won't even be significant because it will just be another day of faithfulness. And this is what we find here, I believe, with Daniel on this day. From verse 10 to the end of, of, of the chapter, which again is all in a very short amount of time, Daniel is again used by God. But I believe that for Daniel, it was just another day where he's having to deal with worldlings, if I can say it that, that way. Because every day is like that. And kings are no different than everyday citizens. I just get up and I'm faithful. Back to the scene at hand. In verse 10, it says, the queen appears. Some issues with who the queen is exactly is the same as we had at the first. There is a debate whether it might be the wife of Belshazzar or his mother or the wife of Nebuchadnezzar still around, uh, putting her influence out there. We're not sure. No one is sure. Whichever she wasn't at the feast, we can see that ourselves as we read scripture. If she comes because of the, the chatter that is going on that's left the banqueting hall and come out as they're looking for someone probably to interpret. And she reminds them. She walks in the door. She sees her, her the, the king wet in the pants. And she says, there's somebody that can help. She must have been a woman of great influence because she addresses the king directly. She must be a woman of great power and influence because she calls upon the king to remember and the expectation is that you're going to listen to what I'm telling you. Her declaration about Daniel is exemplary and reminding him of who Daniel is. And this, at least again, leads us to believe that this queen uh, probably was not his wife, but was probably his mother or even the <laughs> wife of Nebuchadnezzar, knowing these things about Daniel or at least deeply moved by what she had seen or heard and known of what Daniel had done. And notice here a couple of things that the queen remembered as well. First, she remembered his name. Not the name given to him by Nebuchadnezzar, which was Belteshazzar, which means Bel protects his life, which also means that you might think that Belshazzar would remember Belteshazzar. But she remembers, the queen remembers his name, <coughs> Daniel, or Daniel which in Hebrew means God is my judge. 
And so she says in verse 12, Daniel, she calls him Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. And I believe this is a blessing. Sometimes our blessings as God's people are something as simple as someone remembering who we are, that we are God's. In the midst of the world out there, they know us as someone that belongs to him. They identify us as a person of God when they speak about us and not the way that others might speak about us. And the queen remembered this man, Daniel, whom the one true God had used to speak to them so many years ago. And Belshazzar did not remember. The queen also remembered the holiness here of Daniel. He was set apart. Again, another blessing. It's similar to the first, but another blessing. Not only do they know your name, they don't, that you identify with God, but your life has shown forth that you are of the one true God. In verse 11, she says that Daniel had the spirit of the holy gods within him. And this manifested itself in the light and the understanding and the wisdom that were found in him. This is holiness. This is being set apart. And that holiness manifested itself because over the course of Daniel's life and his faithfulness, when the time came, God used Daniel by his spirit to impart knowledge and understanding. And God even gave to Daniel to interpret those dreams, or he gave the interpretation of the dreams to Daniel and to solve riddles. And I would point back to the earlier chapters and it will be stated again in the later chapters that Daniel set himself apart. And it tells us because he stayed in God's word and he was very purposeful in prayer, setting a time to pray every day to be faithful to God. How many of us would have someone say of us that they know we are men or women of God because we are diligent in faithfulness to be in meaningful prayer, that we are about the business of learning God's word and meditating upon God's word. And when called upon, we can answer someone, even simply some question about God's word. This is what we are called to as Christians. You're not going to be uh, an expert overnight, but over the course of years, God will bring fruition to that. The means of grace is what God calls us to, and we should be about the business of attending to that. And so the queen calls for Daniel because he's such a man as this for such a time as this, as we might say. So the queen calls for Daniel, bring him before the king. The king basically and probably grudgingly truncates what the queen has already reminded him of and then, then tells Daniel what's already occurred with his lousy counselors. And then he offers Daniel to be the third ruler of the kingdom, if he will interpret it. And I think... Personally, and again, this is a little bit of speculation, but I, it's, it's the good kind. Daniel walked in that room. He looked at the wall. He looked at the king. And the king offered him to be the third ruler. And Daniel thought to himself, why would I want to be the third ruler for a day? Your kingdom's over. What does this even matter? You can keep your gifts. You can have whatever it is you think you're giving to somebody because it's not going to last more than 24 hours. And so you can have this interpretation for free. And you would think, and he was probably thinking, that this pagan ruler is not even really going to keep up his end of the bargain with what Daniel's about to tell him when he tells him the interpretation of what is written on the wall. In verses 18 through 23 then, Daniel tells Belshazzar and all of us this contrast, the contrast that I mentioned between uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And really there's a complete sermon in these verses, so we'll get through it as quickly as we can. 
But Daniel just reminds us in Belshazzar that it was God who gave Nebuchadnezzar all that he had. Right? That's in one simple sentence. God is the one that gave Nebuchadnezzar everything he had. And when pride came, God brought Nebuchadnezzar to nothing, to an insane man in the woods, until he learned that Yahweh is the Most High God. And Belshazzar, we are now told explicitly, he did know all of this. At some point, he knew all of this about Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe he's forgotten, but he knew. And he should have remembered, as each of us are to remember. And Belshazzar should have been thankful for what God had done for him. And he should have humbled himself as well, but instead, prideful, lifts himself up. We see this in verses 22 through 23. He lifted himself up. Daniel lays out this king's sins before his eyes. You've placed yourself against God. You've taken his holy vessels. You've used them for secular use. You've offered up praises with them to pagan idols and to nothing, to nothing at all, to wood, stone, and metal. But the one in whom we live and move and have our being, you have not honored, though you knew all of this from your youth. And so God is done. He's done with your insolence. He's not taking years to work on you like he did Nebuchadnezzar. You had time. You knew from your youth. It's over. The handwriting is on the wall, as we say today. It's where it comes from. Mene, mene, tekel, or tekel, parson. There's again some discussion on exactly what these words mean. They're in Aramaic, but they're not written in an ordinary way, if you will, in Aramaic. Uh, it can be interpreta- interpreted simply just the words as numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. But of course, Daniel gives us the exact interpretation beginning in verse 26. When he says, this is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. To Kel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. There's not really any need for discussion. There's no offer to repent. There is simply the declaration of judgment. And Daniel, living for some years uh, in apparent obscurity now, is used by God when the time is right. And Daniel is faithful to deliver this message, which again, should be terrifying. It would be terrifying for us as well. This king's going to kill me when I tell him what this wall says. But Daniel's faithful to the end, like it's any other day. Even though, again, we might think that Daniel would be killed for what he is about to declare. And so what we find really here after this declaration is not much. Belshazzar Here's the message, but we get no reaction. Part of the reason for that, we don't think about this, is because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what Belshazzar's reaction is. We can't come to the conclusion, well, if he had just repented, God would have stayed off. No, God declared what was about to happen. He could have been wailing. He could have been... Happy, sad, upset, we don't know. It doesn't matter. God had declared that this was the end. And we have to accept that and move forward. This is coming to pass. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. What Belshazzar does do that we read is he makes Daniel the third ruler. He gives him the purple clothes. He gives him the chain, etc. Some note that this signifies maybe that well, Belshazzar honors Daniel, but he doesn't honor the God of Daniel, um, which is a distinction from Nebuchadnezzar, possibly. But I suspect that what happened here is that Belshazzar thought, if I'm going to die tonight as the second ruler of the kingdom, then Daniel, 
you're going to die tonight as the third ruler of the kingdom. When they storm the gates, they'll get me and they'll get you as well. But we don't know exactly why this occurs. It's just there. It's one of those things we can ask when we enter into eternity. Why did Belshazzar go ahead and make him the third ruler of the kingdom? And then Belshazzar is killed. Darius takes the kingdom. And do not think that this is just some simple throwaway verse to let us know who is next in line. This is a very important verse. And hopefully you will never forget after this point. Who is the king? Who is the king that is going to send the exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple? It's Ezra chapter one, the first verse, the first couple of verses. We read in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. And Cyrus recognized, again, if you go to Ezra and read, that the God of heaven had given him all the kingdoms of the earth. So he allowed the exiles to return. Belshazzar had to go. So Cyrus and Darius, Darius and Cyrus were then put in place, the Medes and the Persians. They were moved into position for God's purposes. God working providentially, sovereignly to save some, to move others so that God's purposes always, always come to pass. Because he had said from Jeremiah, 70 years and then back. God deals in his own way, in his own timing and expects simply faithfulness from us and he'll work out the greater details. Just be faithful. For his glory, he uses his faithful to show forth his glory. And we know all of this. You know all of this as Belshazzar knew all of this. And you need to remember and humble yourself and be faithful. We need to remember to uh, number our days so that we may be given a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12. And the older I get, and I am 51 years old now. It's hard for me to say out loud. I think, how many more actual fruitful years do I really have? Even if it's 25, it's not a lot in the big picture of things. It seems like a lot, especially if you're young. But when you're old, I've got 25 years, good years maybe. How can I best use them? What's the best thing I can do with the years that I have remaining? Are you asking yourself those questions? That's the kind of question God wants you to ask yourself if you are his. What am I doing with my remaining years? Daniel is a man who honored God throughout his entire life. He has a handful of, of major things documented about his life. But the rest was simple faithfulness to God and to his word. Before the great things, again, something we know, before the great things, we must be faithful in the little things. And if great things do come, as we see from these kings, we must remain humble and simply remember that God is working out his purposes. God is always working out his purposes purposes. And again, we just need to be faithful. Amen. Let us pray.